Welcome to Gamescom. It's Saturday afternoon and we're here outside and it seems to be the other way around. I've been stolen by like four <laughs> guys from Grey Goo rather than me stealing one person. Also, there's someone waving to us off camera. So, uh, I'll throw microphones around and everyone can introduce themselves and then we'll ask some questions. So, Hi, I'm Mike Legg, president and co-founder of Petroglyph and uh, I'm a programmer on the Grey Goo team. Uh, I'm Ted Morris. I'm the executive producer on Grey Goo uh, at our developer, uh, Petroglyph. And I'm Frank Lepacki, uh, audio director at Petroglyph. So tell us, well, let, let, let's start with you. Um, tell us a little bit about Grey Goo, like what the, the kind of premise for it. Well, Grey Goo uh, begins uh, in the future where humanity has uh, attempted to explore the universe using a nanite uh, uh, which is called the Grey Goo. And uh, it, it, it is used to uh, explore all of the worlds that they think life might exist. But it turns out that after years of searching, they can't find anything at all. So they retreat back to Earth and they kind of focus on the earthly problems of the and day. Like just leave the garbage there. Yeah, leave it, yeah, leave just it there. Why and, clean and so, up? And so they ignore Somewhere what, there's a space Indian with just a singular <laughs> tear yeah. rolling down the face. And so, and so they, they, uh, they finally realize, hey, wait, there is some life out there. Let's go out and check it out. And they get there, and the life that they find is fighting this unknown force, which turns out to be the but tool that go. they sent out to look for life. So they've caused this problem, and now they have to deal with it. <laughs> Whoops, all bad. Yeah, a little bit. Typical little human bit. Faction, fashion. <laughs> Typical human. I think the, the, the main key point here is always recycle. Yes, yes, absolutely. So um, you've gone to the style of three factions. There's the humans, the beta, and the goo. Now let's let's start with you, Mike. Uh, if you want to tell us a little bit about the humans, the humans are definitely our turtle faction. Um, we love the humans. They they are uh, they're for anybody that loves to build big bases and really play defensively. The human is the fa the humans are the faction for that. And uh, basically, they have to have all of their their structures all placed on the same basic network, everything needs to be connected. So they really can't expand out across the entire map. So they can build conduits to spread out a little bit in their local area, but they really have to stay in within the confines of where, where they start, unlike the beta that can spread out all over the place. Um, the humans also have like kind of like a Tetris-like base building where they can fit things all over the grid of, their, where, their, of where their base is. Um, they have the most powerful turrets so they're very defensive there. Their walls are very cool. Where their walls actually get, their walls form a, uh, they block the field of view. So that so if we were to build a wall and the enemy units rolled up on that wall, they would not be able to see through the wall. It would block their field of view. As well as if you had units behind the wall, your units could fire out at them, which they could not see unless they, unless they had aircraft. And then um, they could also not, they could not fire in. So the, wall, the walls are very cool. Um, the other thing I really like about them is that they can teleport their units around, or they teleport their structures around the base uh, on the fly. So once you've committed resources and built, like say certain types of turrets or factories or, or, or research ner or tech nodes, you can move them around the map in, or around your base. So let's say yet you had a bunch of turrets up to the, down to the south, you got attacked from the north, you could actually take those turrets and relocate them. You don't have to pay the build price. Just wait like five seconds. They'll dematerialize and rematerialize. On top of that, the humans also have a really cool teleporter. So you can build a teleportation pad, amass a bunch of units, and teleport them out across anywhere into the map where they can, they can see. The, they really sound like the kind of, you know, traditional what people are used to. You, you've got your base, you just need to get it up, get strong, and it's got some new tricks in there as well, like the teleportation things you mentioned. And the walls are just such a fun little... It, it, it also removes the whole thing of, okay, I've built this wall. Oh, now I need to build a gate in there as well, oh, which means I have to delete this bit of wall. It's just, no, I have a wall. doesn't bother my units. They go straight through. Everyone else's units, no, this is my land. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And, and um, the, uh, the other thing I really enjoy about them is it's, it's supposed to be our hum you know, us as humans 500 years in the future. So the style of them, I don't know if it was intentional, kind of reminds me of what if Apple Computer basically just took over the planet? And now what would Apple, what would it look like if Apple was building structures and vehicles and weaponry and technology 500 years in the future? So it's kind of funny, it reminds me of that. 
I do like the art style for the humans. It's very sleek, very uh, like smooth, rounded edges. Yeah. It's it's very kind of counterpoint to the kind of um, just industrial style that sometimes we see. Yeah, and, and with the industrial style, that's where the betas come in. You know, the betas are much more of our, you know, they're our, they're our kind of jack of all trades faction. Uh, they're very industrial. They're kind of like almost like the lowest technology. You know, you see a lot of steam and fire and smoke and metal. You know, with, with those guys, you know, a lot of heavy animation, heavy machinery, and the betas, they they basically, unlike the humans, they can actually spread out across the map. They can actually send units out and then set up a uh, a resource, a refi a refinery at a resource, build a factory and start unit production. They can build walls, and the turrets can occupy. You know, the the they can build walls and have turreted sections where units can go in, a um, infantry units can go in and occupy those turrets. And um, but they're but they're definitely like they're definitely more our mo our most versatile. You know, of, of somebody who's used to playing RTS, they would probably be the most familiar faction. Because you're able to have like multiple bases, and you're you're more focused on the the traditional like way of building the bases. I really like the the fact that units can garrison inside walls. It just means that you're very much focused on a mobile kind of. Uh, freeform army in that you can put them where you need them so if you want to take them out of defending say an outpost and move them back to your base to give it a bit of extra firepower you can or if you yeah you can inject them right out if you need if you need them for other use you can you can put them in a defensible position within your walls but you can also pop them out so if that wall section goes down they'll pop out and be able to still continue to defend um, the other nice thing about that is with that with that garrisoning ability or occupation ability um, the epic unit, the hand of Ruck is, or hand of Rook, is the the Uber unit uh, within the Beta faction. That is the big epic unit, and that actually also has nodes where you know the the uh, the infantry can go in and actually garrison garrison into those those structures and be able to fire out. So when you build one of these big epic units, it'll take off, lift up in the air, and start flying around. And it's not only it's not only an assault fortress; it's a it's a flying factory. So while it's flying around the map, it basically, it basically somebody quoted it today. Did I just see the base pack itself up and fly into the air? And that was truly what happened. And so when it's flying around, it's building units. You have guys occupying the uh, the, um, the the slots for for where they can they can fire out. It's also got a big super cannon on top that is long range artillery. And so it's just a big big flying war machine that can also make stuff on the fly. I really love the fact that it doesn't lose the ability to actually like still keep producing units. And also, one of the things I loved seeing from the footage was it, the units jumping into the garrison points on it, and we're just kind of like, okay, we're going to help protect this thing while it's flying along. So it's very slow. It was, it, it's got firepower, but also because of speed, it looks like it could be very easily swarmed. Yeah, and the, the thing is, so when you see that thing coming at your base, you know you've got time to kind of prepare. You know, once that thing gets built, that's on its way. Now, each one of the three factions all have their own epic units. But yeah, once that thing's on its way, it is moving slow. And <laughs> anyways, but yeah, so you just, you definitely know that you, you have a bit of time to prepare for it. And then, and then it's like, once it gets to your base, you gotta really take it out fast. Great, so let's turn this way and let's ask you, why is the Grey Goo faction superior in every way, <laughs> shape and form? <laughs> Well, uh, the Grey Goo is very awesome, it's true. Um, it is super unique amongst the other factions in the game, but also in all the RTS games that are out there right now. There's nothing out there like it. Um, it's, it's really cool. It's also super powerful. Um, as Mike mentioned earlier, you know, the, the, uh, the other two factions are cool. They've got, they've got great epic super weapons. They've got a good variety of, of structures and, uh, and units to select from. But uh, the awesome thing about the Grey Goo is that it's just, it's, it's, uh, it's elegant in its uh, simplicity. Uh, it's very easy to manage. It's actually one of the easiest factions to pick up and start learning to play. However, it's one of the most difficult factions to master. Yeah. Uh, because the Grey Goo, uh, the Grey Goo uh, thrives on, on uh, consuming and uh, splitting and dividing and then multiplying across the map. So the way that the Grey Goo uh, achieves victory is by just overwhelming its opponent. And so if your playing style uh, is, uh, is one of which you can, you can handle many, many things at one time, you can juggle a lot of balls at one time, the Grey Goo is definitely the faction for you. 
and you're going to excel at it because uh, you can manage up to seven or eight mother goos, which are almost like bases within themselves. So imagine, imagine moving and maintaining seven or eight RTS bases while you're simultaneously creating units, hiding from the enemy, attacking the enemy, and, uh, and just basically causing general mayhem across the map. Um, it's, it's, it's a great faction to play, and I think people are going to really, really enjoy it. So if you're, some, uh, if you're someone that's looking for something that's a little bit more leaning towards the micro style, then the goo is the one for you because you've got so much to actually, you know, quick, quickly change between. And if you manage to actually keep it all going, you're going to be able to move a lot faster yeah. in production. Yeah, you know, um, we've actually really focused on the macro of the gameplay. Um, you know, some of the tedium that that is included in some of the other RTSs out there uh, of the past uh, have included, you know, uh, managing all the little harvesters or all the little yeah. uh, farmers or workers and then building engineers. Yeah, yeah, all the different special abilities. We focused on the macro. We want you to have a big epic experience and we want you to be able to control those units on an easy way. Uh, so, you know, instead of trying to figure out, well, how many workers do I have on a, on a particular resource point, um, you're, you're focused on, on managing the combat and building your large epic base. So. Okay, so... Frank, I've got I've got like um, some questions for you regarding the audio. Like, sure. What what kind of theme and style have you gone with for the overall uh, direction of the music for the game? So um, so the music in the game, I've actually I've actually got like three different soundtracks depending, depending on which on faction the, you're yeah. playing. So uh, we really wanted to you know emphasize the personality that these factions bring and the uniqueness of them. You know because they're they have some different play styles. They have some you know obviously different aesthetics that that uh, are complementary. So. Uh, I wanted to do uh, music that fit each of those aesthetics and play styles. Uh, the betas, for example, uh, because they have units that are like heavily armored and have you know like you know smoke and fire and and, and just really this gritty sort of uh, approach. I wanted to make the soundtrack more industrial. Yeah. So I used like things like um, you know metallic you know percussion and and like heavy brass and some distorted synths and things like that to kind of add to that grit, add to that sort of uh, machined sound that they might have. Um, the human faction is very clean and very futuristic and high tech. Uh, their units are all hovering, you know. So I wanted to do something very like synthetic and, and clean sounding for them. So uh, very modern electronica is is kind of their yeah. their general direction, with a little bit of uh, orchestral mixed into that to kind of add some organicness and and achieve a connection of of human to machine. Uh, but then also um, we have the goo, and that was the most probably the most fun uh, to to come up with a style for because uh, they're so mysterious and eerie the way they move around and traverse terrain and go over mountains and consume buildings and enemy units and things like that. I was just like, gosh, you know, it's like this is like a force I wouldn't want to you know feel coming at me, and I wanted to, the music to kind of emphasize that too. Yeah. So I went with a really dark orchestral score with a lot of choir to kind of emphasize the, the doom of it, you know, in a sense, and the mysteriousness and the eeriness. And then I mixed that with dubstep during their combat to kind of, you know, uh, emphasize their just really, like, over overwhelming consumption, you know, that uh, that goes on. And it was, it was a ton of fun to make. We use a live orchestra on it as well. I went up to Budapest a little while ago yeah. and um, recorded their symphony in their choir. So that's going now to be mixed in with uh, all of the other elements that, uh, that are part of the compositions. So who's your favorite faction? Oh my gosh, that is a hard one. I tend to, as a player, I tend to uh, go more towards the human faction because I love building the, the bases up and defending everything and getting the turrets out and all of that stuff. So I, I love uh, just having a nice big fortress. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, Ted, can I... Um, Ted, can you tell us a little bit about the, the single player, the, the campaign, how it's structured and stuff? Yeah, sure. Uh, so we've uh, we partnered with uh, Axis uh, to, to build a really, really great campaign. We've got uh, good writers that have uh, applied a lot of effort, I mean months and months of effort, to create a story campaign that takes you, that starts you out with the, with the, uh, the beta faction, and they're dealing with this new threat to uh, Planet Nine, which is where it all takes place. And then you play about five missions through that campaign, and then you, you step over to the human side of things, and what the humans are, are seeing on the, on the battlefield and how they're dealing with this threat, not only with the gray goo, but also their new 
allies or friends or enemies. They're not really sure with the beta race. Yeah. And then finally, for the last five missions, you jump over to the goo perspective. And we've got a great way that we, and I don't want to ruin anything about the story, but we've got a really great transition from one faction to the next. So it really all comes together seamlessly and creates a great story. And uh, with the campaign uh, cutscenes before and after each mission, um, you really get a sense of the uh, the epic story behind this 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 uh, event that's going. <coughs> excuse me, that's going on. So uh, it, it's great. It's really great, um, and it's really high quality. And the quality of the video is just excellent. Um, I got to say that this is definitely one of the 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 most intriguing stories we've ever put together in in uh, conjunction with uh, with Graybox and Axis. Yeah. So swinging back this way, Mike. For the the single player campaign, AI is obviously you know going to be really important. You guys have done some interesting things. Do you want to talk a little bit about us? Because you just exploded into talking about it back in the the, the demo. So I thought I'd throw Mike under you, and you could just go for it. To. Yeah, as a programmer, um, I just, you know, I'm working on the project. You know, I, I'm all about all the technology, and I love <clears throat> I love the, you know, that we're using DirectX 11. You know, we have, you know, LAN mode support. You know, we have, you know, so people don't even have to be connected to the Internet to play. You know, we've got Internet, you know, we've got full Internet, multiplayer, you know, all that good stuff. And um, and then we love how the, how the goo is rendered. The goo is like... A, um, it's not modeled. It's not pre-modeled and textured by the artists. It's procedurally generated when it's in its goo form. So we, I think that's really exciting. But the AI is like really one of the big things I'm excited about as a player and as a and as a programmer, because it's the first time that we haven't really had a scripted AI system. And you know, most RTSs do use a, a scripted AI system where you kind of like based on the mission or based on the the camp the the multiplayer scenario or whatever it is that you're doing there's usually like a pre-built order of what an ai will do and how it'll build its base and how it'll generate resources and when it'll have to kind of cheat and look into the map to see like where the enemy is and what the enemy is doing and uh sometimes ais cheat and give themselves a little bit more credits and things like that and it just you know, and usually, you know, for the game, everybody's always trying to make the most fun game possible. And that does, in the past and, and times, revolve, involve kind of like tweaking the AI and giving it little boosts and stuff like that. So it, has, so it makes a fun play experience. But with this AI, it's not scripted at all. It's completely reactive. And people ask, well, does it learn? And it's like, no, it's not a learning AI. It's a reactive AI. And what it does is it sends out scout units and it goes and it sees what you're doing. And it will change its behavior on the fly based on, it'll reallocate resources and change its build plans. And it'll constantly monitor what you're doing based on what it sees and it'll react. So if you are building a ton of aircraft and it has a scout and it goes into your base and sees a ton of aircraft, that AI is gonna start building some anti-air. It's gonna start getting ready for you. It knows, it keeps track of where you are, it keeps track of where you're harvesting and it remembers everything it last saw with what you're doing. And it just really creates some incredible play experiences because as you change your strategies, especially with your your customization of your faction, because you could you can you as a player can customize your tech tree, you have five different technologies, and each one of those technologies you have three choices. And of those three choices of the five different technology types, you could pick one to focus on to change your kind of like your play style. So you've got this really nice permutation of each faction and how they they kind of customize and the AI does the same thing too it'll change its tech upgrade plans and how it's teching up its base to play differently too so it just gives you a really cool robust play experience where the AI will do different and unexpected things and it just it's very hard to find a way to exploit the AI like we used to in the past like we could once you figured out what the AI was bad at you could completely stomp over it because you knew how it was going to react to situations or what it was going to build or how it was going to spend its money. And so people could find, you know, exploits that would just allow you to tromp right over the AI. And in this case, the AI is always evolving, you know, and changing and, and, and rethinking what it's, what it's going to do. And so um, this is the first time we've ever done it in an RTS game, and we just were thrilled with it. It also does risk assessment from uh, what we saw. Like, like uh, it, won't, it won't throw 
units that it, know it knows it's going to lose at something. Like when you, uh, one of the epic units spawned, it, it pulled all of its troops back and regrouped rather than essentially just trying to take it down with three and losing them. Oh, it, was, it was amazing, in fact, because what happened was the AI player, I think it was the humans, um, no, no, I think it was Goo. It was the Goo. The Goo had actually created some combat units. Yeah, it had the, uh, the walker thing. Yeah, and it had it had a bunch of units hidden within the, the the foliage, you know, where you can hide units in brush, and so units can hide within like within in the tree line under the trees, and the other the other uh, uh, other factions can't see what you have hidden in there, unless they move units within as well. So it's a great place to set up ambushes and to hide, and the goo had been amassing some serious combat forces down within in, in one of the, the, the tree covered areas outside of my base. And then we managed to get the resources together and build an epic unit. It was the humans and we built the Alpha, which is a giant flying robot. And we sent the Alpha off flying. We had no idea the goo was there. And as the Alpha came flying up on the tree line, all these goo units just started running out and heading off the other way because they knew that they could outrun them. So yeah, it did a risk assessment. It decided not to attack. And the AI could be very aggressive, and all of its units started running away because it knew that that epic was so powerful, and it, they knew that they were faster. So they started heading around the lake, and they decided to come down and start pummeling the base on the other side, and they didn't want to get killed off by the epic. So that was just a delightful moment when you see it suddenly start to flee. So it's looking like it's starting to rain here, and we've taken up quite a lot of your time. Um, have you got a release schedule in mind? Yeah, it's um, we're going to be releasing in early 2015. So um, it's almost, you know, we're, we're getting everything down in the can now. We've, we're feature locked. We're doing polish. We're doing bug fixes. You know, we're starting to look into the additional content of what we're going to do, you know, and post-launch plans and things like that. So, but currently the plan is, you know, to launch on, it's be available on Steam, be available in January, February, very, very early 2015. And, um, but we will have uh, o uh, closed beta and open beta starting up so people can sign up for beta at www.graygoo.com and they can, get, they can get into the beta and start playing it. Mr. Enforcer, do you want to just say that website name again so everyone's got it crystal clear? www.graygoo.com. A man of very few words. So, Frank, is there anything you would like to add as a final leaving message? Claw.